Nashville, Tennessee, the state capital, the fastest growing city in the U.S. right now, home of hot chicken, right in the heart of the Bible Belt, and we are known for music. Music City, USA. We're not just known for country anymore. Things are so diverse, and it will blow your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul the Fifth, and I am walking down Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee. I am giving to you studio tours. Right behind me are some of the classic studios right here in the city. Here in Music Row, we are immersed with music studios such as this one right behind me. Everywhere you go, there is a studio. You can throw a rock and hit a musician or a recording studio here in Nashville. In this series, I'm gonna be taking you to some of the home studios in Nashville. Behind me is a commercial facility. We'll be visiting some of those as well. We might be seeing some big ones, some small ones, maybe some bedroom producers, and some studios in between. And guess what? I might have a celeb or two on the show as well. And if you are ready, let's go. Do you like drums? Do you enjoy music in general? And do you possibly like music industry conversations? And if you answer yes to any of those three questions, and this video just might be for you. What's up everyone? My name is Paul the Fifth, Fifth and I run Legacy Studios Nash. Boy, oh boy, do I have a great one for you today. We are making a trip to the north side of Nashville today. We're visiting a relatively new friend of mine. He is a very solid drummer and he's played in multiple genres from CCM. If you don't know what that means, it stands for Christian Contemporary Music. We have some things in common. We look pretty similar. Not only is he a solid drummer, he is solid in his faith. He's a great hang. He is humorous and he has an awesome studio and you get to meet him today. His name is Dango, and today I'm taking you on a tour of Dango's Beat Lab. And if you're ready, let's go meet him. What's up? Welcome to the Beat Lab. You met Mr. Brown. Hey, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Come on in. All right, thank you. This is my spot. All right, everybody. Welcome to Dango's Beat Lab. I'm Paul the Fifth with Dango. Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself, who you are as a drummer, and how you got to come out here to Nashville? Yeah, man. Thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my name is Dango. I've been in Nashville for eight years, nine years or so this time. But I actually moved from Wisconsin. I came here to go to Belmont University, studied with Chester Thompson and Brian Fullen. I was there almost five years. Great experience. Then I moved to Seattle for eight years, played in a punk band called Amber Pacific, played on the Warp Tour. That was kind of my dream. Did that for a long time. Those are some of my closest brothers still. And then eventually decided I need to move back when the band slowed down. I thought I want to be a hired gun. I want to get into this. So actually I came back in 2012. Really, I'm coming on 10 years right now that I've been back in Nashville, not eight. And since being back, I've had a chance to play a lot of rock, a lot of country, a lot of Christian rock, a lot of worship, and that sort of thing. I've been teaching lessons that whole time. I do drum lessons here all the time every week when I'm in town and travel a lot on the weekends. I track remotely from here as well. And so I kind of do all these things and just try to build my career, my brand, what I'm doing and try to be, you know, as available as I can, be the best as I can at different things, you know, to the best of my ability so that I can be employable. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So when I was about 12, I had a retainer and I was telling you off camera that I played saxophone. Yeah. You can't really play saxophone with a retainer in your mouth because it's a woodwind instrument. And as a 12 year old kid, I just began naturally banging around on stuff. Yeah. So my dad said, why don't you start playing drums? So I did. At the time, we had a, I mean, from Evansville, Indiana, we had a college station, University of Evansville, and they had a hip-hop radio station. So dad was like, that's cool that you're listening to that, but how about we round out your musical, what you're listening to? Yeah. He's like, do you realize that a lot of these hip-hop and R&B songs were sampled from jazz and other classics? I'm like, you're lying. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, no, let me show you. Yeah. So then I started learning jazz. I think you said like Latin and things. That's when I came across Chester Thompson. 
Stan Getz, all those different backgrounds and musical styles. Did rock for the longest time. I don't really have one thing. So that's cool that you've been in multiple Yeah, genres. I, I try to be. But like for me growing up, I'm a pastor's kid, grew up in the church, and that's where I started playing. I didn't start until middle school, really, and played in high school concert band and took private lessons. So I started learning to read around that time, but I was really narrow-minded as far as like I listened to rock and that's what I liked and you know I wasn't going to branch outside of that. So when I got to Belmont when I was 18, Chester was like, look, we're going to do jazz. And I was like, I don't really like jazz. I don't want to play jazz. He's like, I don't care. This is what you need to learn. So that was really great for me. Four years of that. And it's not like I'm any jazz guy. I'm just saying, forcing myself to go through a lot of the, a lot of those books and that stuff was so good for me. And opened my mind to like, wow, there's a lot of music in this world I didn't know existed. And then I started studying with Brian Full in there, and he's done a ton of great stuff too. And he pushed me a lot on funk, and again, a world I wasn't open to. And then I took lessons with Todd London, who was our percussion teacher at Belmont, still there. But I said, hey, I want to learn Latin, so let's work on that. So I was taking private lessons from three different teachers while I was there in those four years, because I was really trying to push myself out of the box of, I'm not just going to be this rock guy. And... I played in a punk band at Belmont, and that was my dream. So when I left school, I was like, I'm punk rock. I'm still going to do this. But that's still in my roots. I'm always going to come back to that. But I studied all that other stuff so that hopefully I can keep growing in it and keep learning. And I think the biggest thing it did was it just opens your mind, like you're saying, to there's all this other music. And there's music in the world you don't know exists because you have your narrow-minded what you like. And that's great to like what you like. But you start hearing other stuff, and you're like, wow, this is might not be your thing, but you realize this is amazing, or this is great musicianship, or there's great drums in it, or great arrangements, or just something that you didn't think of before. So I'm still like in that frame of mind. I kind of get stuck listening to whatever I'm learning, or whatever I'm listening to at the time, or whatever's on the radio, and then I hear something totally new and crazy. I'm just like, man, I didn't know that part of the world existed musically. So it's just fun to constantly be open to learning. So I'm always encouraging my students, you gotta listen to music, you gotta listen to more than what you like try to listen to stuff you don't like as well for sure i agree when i was starting off i wanted to play drum kit right away yeah well my instructor was like paul you can't ride a bike without learning training wheels i said well what do you mean he's like well we gotta start working on rudiments yeah i said man i don't want to do that that sucks yeah that's what we're gonna do for the next six months so wow. I'll prepare right and i'm like okay we did it and he started showing me here's why we got to do that if you want to be able to learn some of these really cool little licks and fills, he started showing me some paradiddle stuff. And I'm like, you know what? This makes sense. Let me go yeah. ahead and do it. So we built that foundation. And then we incorporated that into all these different styles of music and everything like that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I started rudiments kind of in high school, but again, kind of in college and still, like I probably make my students now learn eight or 10. I don't make everybody go through all 40, but there's probably eight or 10 that I'm like, you gotta know these, these are really gonna help you. And some students fight back and fight back and don't wanna do it. <laughs> and then eventually you start getting into fills or different grooves, you know, even any kind of basic funk stuff and you start doing paradiddles or double paradiddles or any inverted paradiddles. And it's just like, if you learn this, it's gonna make the groove a lot easier to learn. So, exactly. For sure. <laughs> What's one of your favorite paradiddles, or not paradiddles, um, favorite rudiments? Uh, I've been on a flam accent kick lately. I don't know why, but. I just started working on like Swiss Army triplets that are close. Ooh. I'm trying to go back and forth just because. If I'm actually playing, I use paradiddles a lot. I really like in 6 8 using a paradiddle diddle, like using it as a groove, sometimes as a fill. That's one that I come back to a lot that I didn't learn as a kid. I'm trying to get kids where they can memorize these, and I feel like kids soak stuff up. So if I give them a room, like just memorize it, just memorize the stick. I'm going to ask you every week. Once they do, it's like I know they're going to. They're going to be 40 or 50 and still know how to play that rudiment. So yeah. that's the cool thing. You can start young like that. You can yeah. remember those versus I'm 41 now. My friend, she's trying to teach me guitar. And I'm like, man, if I would have done this 20 years ago, <laughs> right. I'd be a pro. Yeah, but that's how I feel practicing some of the rudiments now. I'm like, why didn't I do this when I was a kid? It'd be so much easier. But yeah, it's never too late to learn. I always tell people too. I'm a big fan of paradiddles. This may not be a rudiment, but like sex tuplets. I love doing those around oh, yeah. the kit. And I use two hi-hats too. So I have one on my right and one on my left. Okay. 15 inch on this side and then like 14 on this. I like doing paradiddles on that a lot. Nice. I've never played with the second hi-hat ever at any point in my career. It's unique. It's cool. There's not a lot of people that do it. I got the idea from Dave Weckl. So this is how old I am. Well, I said 41, but I was watching tapes on VHS. Yeah. <laughs> 
Back to Basics with Dave Weckl. Tony Royster Jr. is a huge influence. Dennis Chambers, Stuart Copeland. I wanted to ask you, like, who are some of your yeah. drumming um, influences? And they kind of come from different places. Like, when I think all-around drummers, I'm a big fan of Abe Laboreal Jr. Oh, my gosh. And I love that he's... I think, honestly, the first time I heard him, I was in college, and it was the Vanessa Carlton, her first record, The Piano Girl, which I love that record. But there was all these cool drum parts, and I'm like, who is this? And I looked him up, and then realized he was playing with Paul McCartney, and then started kind of digging into a lot of stuff he'd done. Tons of big stuff. And then when I was at school, we kind of nerded out on a lot of the drummers. As far as, like, the big rock guys, I grew up liking Neil Peart. I didn't really get into Bonham until later, because I wasn't exposed to Zeppelin early on. And now, like, I really like him, but... I just didn't grow up on that. I'm a big fan of guys like Josh Freeze, too, who's an L.A. guy, can play on anything. You know, I see him on different gigs. I've seen him live. I've seen him on the Warp Tour, but then see him with Sting or see him on a Michael Buble record or, like, something that's totally different. I'm just, like, I love that guys do that kind of stuff. There's a ton of guys in town that I look up to and their different styles and how they play here as well. And then there's a bunch of punk rock drummers who aren't, like, known to the rest of the world, really, other than, like, Travis Barker. But there's right. there's a lot of guys in that genre that I grew up into the fast stuff that I really love their playing as well. Smelly from No Effects is one of my favorites. Yuri from MXPX. Those are guys. Dave Ron from Lagwagon. Just bands that I really like that are, like, super, super fast. And so I played years of that stuff. And I'm probably one of the only guys in Nashville that would appreciate that now. But that influenced me a lot in the time. And I grew up on a lot of worship, too, so... This huge band called Delirious back in the day. I was really into them. I'm really into U2, so they affected the worship movement so much. So I like a lot of how Larry Mullen plays. Junior, his stuff is cool. But just straight up, if you're like, who are guys you would want to play like? Dave Roll and Taylor Hawkins are always guys to me that I'm not saying to play like them, but I'm just like, I love watching them. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of energy that I just think, man. Those are like the household name guys that I'd be like, yeah. If I could play like Taylor or like Dave Grohl, those are, those are the dudes for sure. Crazy about... Uh... What's his name? Dave Matthews. Um, Carter? Carter. Beaufort. What about him? I oh, was... I'm just crazy about oh, oh, his drum style. Yeah. Flash hi-hat. It's unreal, yeah. Crazy, yeah. And just him back there chewing gum. My instructor yeah. would always tell me, can't chew gum, you gotta keep time. And then here's Carter, the guy that I look up to yeah. who's doing that. He was one of the first guys that I saw. I was in high school and they hit that I think was like so recognizable that made me go, man, you could be a drummer and have like you could stand out in the band as, like in our generation of, you wouldn't have to know the song, but you'd know if he was playing. There's drummers like that. Not everybody's like that. Some guys are just, you know, play meat and potatoes, and that's going to be perfect. But it's amazing when a guy has a style that unique. I think Travis Barker's the same way. You can hear him on a song, not know the artist, and be like, oh, that's who that is. I mean, I was never a big Dave Matthews fan, but every time I listen to him, I'm just like, that guy's unbelievable. Like, he's taken this craft to a level that is just so beyond. I can't imagine the time put in. And, and guys like, you know, Vinny and Weckl and kind of the, you know, the virtuosos, I just listened to them. I remember hearing Weckl talk about playing eight hours a day for X number of years. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I've never done that once in my life. I don't know how a guy can sit down and commit months of his life to doing eight hours a day. But there's guys like that. And it's just, it's, it's why they play at a whole other level than mm -hmm. most people. So. so you said you played in the CCM world as Christian contemporary music. Who's some of the artists that you played with there. So moving back to Nashville, I played with Christian rap rock guy named Manifest, done some touring with him. I played with Super Chick, which is a Christian rock band, a female singer. I played, did a tour with Fireflight, played a whole year with them. They're another one that is a rock band with a couple girls in it. Did you ever play Stand Up? Yeah. yeah Dude, I, I love that <laughs> song. Course. That's great because a lot of these people I don't see anymore, but like I'll see them passing on social media or see somebody has a child or whatever. So you stay in touch, you bump into people because that's what's fun about Nashville. The biggest Christian rock band I played for is Red, and they're kind of in the Christian world, out of the Christian world, but that was part of helping me after that gig. That was part of the reason that Stapp hired me without having heard me play because he's like, oh, I like Red, and if he can hang on that stuff, he'll be fine. What was that time frame that you played for Red? I played for Red in 2014. It was right after Joe left, and he was their longtime drummer. Okay. And he was the one who called me for it. And so that's when I came in, and I was like, I didn't know their music. I honestly had never heard their music, but I knew they were pretty big. And I knew, I needed, like, I knew they'd sold over a million records, and I knew they had a following and everything. So I jumped into that one really short notice and had to learn a bunch of songs super quick. The record that was out was Release the Panic 2014, so that's the touring. That's the year that I toured with them. I was just asking because 
in 2017, I was going to audio school at SAE. Yeah. And I got done with finals one day and I was in East Nashville. I get a request. I was driving Uber and I picked up the lead singer, I think Mike, Mike yeah. and then Chad, their sound guy. And I started talking to him. I was like, I know this guy. He's got the big yeah, beard. Yeah, red beard. And they're talking about going to a show that night and setting up. And I was like, okay, man, I got to ask. I recognize you. I can't put two and two together. Who are you yeah. opening up for? He's like, we're opening up for Breaking Benjamin. And I'm like, okay, what's your name? Oh, I sing in this band called Red. And I'm like, dude, I got to get a picture with you. So he was cool enough to look yeah. get pictures. So huge That's fan awesome. of Red. That's awesome. And I've done a ton of worship. And when you're talking just straight CCM, I played for Trisha from Super Chick and played on her solo record. I played with Chris Rice back in the day. They're playing with this worship band, Sonic Flood, that's been around forever. It's over 20 years, but I've only played with them the last like five years or so. And we usually play at Easter. We're getting ready to play at Easter again. Okay. So those dudes are awesome. And it's so fun to play like songs that I played in church in high school. Mm -hmm. They kind of pioneered a lot of that early worship rock stuff. Phil Joel from the Newsboys, another guy I played with back in the day. I played in some music videos with a few other artists here and there, or like a couple one-offs or tours or whatever, but that's all the, that I can think of, that's all the CCM stuff. So I know Scott Stapp was a big name. You said that came from... It kind of just came timing-wise. After Red, I played for Fireflight for a whole year, and at the end of that year, I got this call to play for Scott. And kind of cool how that came about, I played a country showcase that year with the bass player from Scott, Sammy, who's now like a dear friend. And I just said, hey, you know, if you guys ever have an opening, keep me in mind, which is like, you don't really say, but I just happened to say that day because he knew he played for a rock guy. And so six months later, he called me. He's like, hey, man, we're in a kind of an emergency, and our drummer got in an accident. And their drummer was a super great guy, and he was wanting to come off the road anyways, but he had an accident, got hit by a car, which was crazy. Oh, yeah, and he's totally fine now. At any rate, it was like, do you want to try out for the gig? And so I ended up talking to them. I was like, I don't have time to try out. I'm on the road. I'm on tour. When's it start? It was going to start in December, and we were mid-November. I was like, I'm going to Finland and Norway with Firefly. I said, I'm not backing out. I'm, they've already got flights, international flights. So if you'll just take me on my word that I can do the gig. So I never sent a video or anything. And they were kind of like, well, we don't take anybody without seeing them. I'm like, well, trust me, I can play this stuff. It's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And so December 1st, I started with them. And we rehearsed, and it was an all kind of new band, except for Sammy, who'd been there. And that December, we went to South Africa. So my first gigs with Stapp were on a different continent, and they thought we were Creed there, and it was like a different world. <laughs> I'm coming from playing with all these Christian rock bands and country artists to, like, we get down there, and it's just it's this huge deal. And so I thought, man, this is crazy. Like, this is going to be the gig for, you know, change my career for my life. And it's been great. The people have been great. But we came back to America for a normal tour, and you just you go back to playing clubs and House of Blues and theaters, and I'm not knocking the people here. It's just like, if you go to a different country and you're an American band, it's it's next level. You know, the people just go nuts. So I've been with Scott six years. We've toured a lot of South America. We've done a whole Brazil tour, several cities there. Those have been cool experiences. And then I've played a lot of Europe with different Christian bands over the years. But I've never been to anywhere in Asia, and I've never been to Germany. There's still places like, you know, that I really hope to get to, but I just think I'm really thankful I've gotten to play in, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 14, something amount of different countries. And that's one of those things with our career, like most people will never experience. Most people won't leave their hometown or their state. You know, right. think we, get, we have the chance to go all over the world and do this thing musically, can connect with people that have never met you. And that's a blessing that I wouldn't ever take for granted because that's, that's one of the biggest reasons I still do it. I'm 40. I still love traveling. People are like, you know, aren't you going to hate it at some point? And like, maybe, no. but for me, I still love it, yeah. There's, it's tiring. It gets old. The flights, the airports, sometimes sitting in vans or cars or buses or whatever, but I still love it. Cool. Yeah. You know, one thing that would be awesome if you went to, like, Africa, you're probably familiar with uh, this guy, but Co is it Cobus or Coib Cobus? I do know Cobus kind of well. Not that, I shouldn't say super well, but I do know him. Yeah, and we always talk at Nam. He's a great guy, DW guy, and we did a signing at a for Audix Mics a few years back, and so I got to talk to him for like an hour that day. And he was just so humble and such a great guy and great player, and he's kind of built his whole thing that he does, so mm -hmm. he's definitely a good dude. Did you see the thing with him and Casey Cooper last summer with yeah. the uh, Sweetwater drum off? Yeah. That was, was really pretty cool. awesome. Yeah. He's done some awesome stuff. He was so big on pioneering that whole. You know, there's only a few guys back in the day that pioneered the early YouTube and drum videos, and he was definitely one of them. 
So talking about him pioneering things, I wanted to ask you, when did you realize that drumming and music is something that you wanted to do as a career? Man, for me it was, high school my dream was to be an athlete, and I played baseball and basketball and ran cross country, and in high school I was really planning to like try to go to college for sports, that was my thing. And music was always secondary, and I had this knee problem, I'd had pain all my life, so in high school I ended up having a bone cadaver transplant basically, where they take a bone from a dead body and put it into yours, did this major knee surgery, you know, cut my leg off from here to here. I was on, a, and back in the 90s too, I was in a wheelchair for, I don't know, I feel like three months maybe, and then on crutches. So it was this big thing, and I said, you're never going to play sports again. And I already had a heart surgery in high school, and I've had some weird health issues over the years. So I was just like, well, can I still drum? That's like the other thing I do. And they said, sure. So that's really when I said, let's look at Belmont. Like, I need to seriously consider if music is the way to go. Personally, I'm a Christian, so I spent a lot of time praying about it and asking God, like, what's my next step? What's my direction? Felt like I was supposed to go to Nashville. And just, I applied to three or four colleges and got accepted to all of them. But I went, the only one I went to visit was Belmont. And I went and did my audition. And I was like, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to do. So it was kind of age 18 that I said, this is, this is really, I think, what I want to do full time. And I never looked back. And one thing I really kind of attribute to Chester is he really kind of ingrained in me from there. 18 to 22 was like, man, if this is what God calls you to do, don't have a fallback plan. Like, do this because life's going to get hard. Stuff's going to come up. Family's going to come up. Career, deaths, all, all these kind of things are going to come up in life and paying the bills. And it's like, if you're not set on this is where you're supposed to be, you're going to quit because it's going to get really hard. And I think back how that hit me at 18. I was like, okay, cool. You know, you don't really think about it. But looking at it now at 40, I'm like, man, that was huge to me because there were so many hurdles in life where I wanted to stop or start something else. And I was like, I don't even know what else I would do. Like, this is all I've put my life into now. So this is what I do. So that was huge for me to just keep going. And that was very influential on my overall outlook of life. And that's not to say you can't change directions. Of course you can. And I think God moves people and calls people into different stuff. My career today doesn't look like what I thought it looked like 20 years ago. Right. But I'm so thankful to do it. Yeah, I'd love to be a huge rock star in a band and make it in one band for your whole life. That'd be awesome. But that's like winning the lottery. I don't care how good you are. Very few people will ever get to live that dream. If I can make a living playing drums, teaching drums, recording drums, playing drums in town, to me this is, I'm getting to live the dream. And I have to constantly remind myself that when I have a tough day or can't pay the bills or have a crappy weekend or my car breaks down or whatever, like stuff happens to all of us. I'm super thankful because I'm playing drums and making a living. I'm doing it in Nashville, music city of the world. I was able to buy a house doing it. So there's just been so many blessings I look back and think it's been a tough go. I've gone through a divorce the last few years. I've had some stuff that's just like I didn't anticipate in life and had gigs come and go and gigs will always come and go and your career is always going to keep changing. But if you can keep going, you can keep working. And like that's what I encourage people. Like keep going, keep working on yourself, be the best you can be, but be the best you can be at yourself. You're never going to be Carter Beaufort. You're never going to be <laughs> Vinny, but you don't have to. You got to be the best version of you that you can be. Because that's who is going to be hireable. What you do is going to be totally different than them. And yeah, you're going to take all your influences into one person and you're going to be those influences. But I just think I can't try my whole life to be Dave Grohl or whoever. You know, you just mm -hmm. can't do that because you won't be him. He's already doing it. You've got to be the best version of you. i got to be the best version of me. And think, how can I make a difference with my life, with music? How can I reach people? How can I encourage people? And, you know, if I'm teaching kids this week... And I'm playing a gig, and then tomorrow I'm in Texas. Like, who am I going to be around? Who can I influence and hopefully encourage their life, bless them, make it better, leave a good impression? Because I don't always sometimes come out there and have a crappy attitude or have a bad day or whatever and complain about whatever. But my goal, especially as a Christian, is think, how can I encourage people? How can I use the gift of music to reach people? And that's a long rant about it, but that's sort of my overall view of how I look at drumming, music, career, but just like, what's your calling in life? What are you supposed to be doing? And for me, I'm, I'm super content knowing this is where I'm at. The gigs are going to come and go. The career is going to change, but I'm going to do music as long as, as long as God lets me. That's beautiful. That is inspiration. <laughs> and I'm sure anybody that's watching, I'm sure will probably feel the same. I have a similar story. I've always wanted to do drums and we got a keyboard in 1992. I said, dad, I'm going to be a musician one day. Yeah. I don't know how, but it's going to happen. And then we just started coming down here to Nashville from Evansville, Indiana. How far is that? 
three hours maybe. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, so it's nice to make a quick weekend trip home. Yeah. We would come to like the Opry when it was still like the theme park mm -hmm. before the flood and everything. We would come to go to that and then in high school we would come and go shopping and I'm like, I love this city. Yeah. And I felt a calling and I was like, I didn't know what it was. But one thing that hit me in 2015, I don't think I shared this with you, but I was adopted from oh. Hope International. Wow. That's and awesome. Yeah. And Winter Jam at the time, that was their main sponsor. I thought, how cool would it be to move to Nashville and try to become part of that and be part of Winter Jam? Yeah. It's kind of like full circle. So we sure. adopted from it. Now it's on the tour. And I've talked to them, it didn't quite work out. So I'm doing my own version of tours, like visiting my friend's home studios like this. Mm -hmm. But I did get accepted to Belmont. So that story is my friend Brad, that was a bus driver, was driving KC, Kip, and then Lady A got me tickets. I was so excited, got to have lunch and dinner with him in the green room before the show and be at the front of the house during the show. Yeah. But I said, hey guys, where did you learn how to do all the sound stuff? And they're like, well, we went to Belmont and Nashville, the whole tour is based out of there. And I'm like, I gotta get to Nashville somehow. Yeah. And so I did, applied, and I couldn't get any like funding at the time. So I had to push that off. But I went to SAE where I got the live sound and studio experience. So it's kind of the both or the best of both worlds, yeah. learn how to do all that stuff. And as a drummer, it's cool because I can see how to do drumming and track drums and like all these other instruments too. So that was inspiration, that was great. Well, thanks. That's awesome, you gotta do all that. And like I was telling you earlier, like the fact that you can engineer and be a drummer, that's the biggest challenge for me because I spent the last 25 years, 30 years trying to develop the drumming skills when I was in school, we didn't talk about engineering. We, that was like a whole separate thing. Like you're an engineer, you're a drummer. We didn't know people were gonna have home studios. We didn't know people could record on a laptop. Like none right. of that existed. We didn't even have iPhones yet. So nowadays students just grow up learning it and they grow up in church playing to a click and playing to tracks. We didn't even talk about that when I was at Belmont. It's crazy to think now everything I play on the road is to tracks. So I've had to kind of learn. And I have so many engineer friends that I'm thankful come over and help me and move mics and try different stuff and go, oh, no, you're doing that wrong but I'm still constantly learning because I'm not an engineer and I'm trying to become one, but it's just so frustrating learning curve because I'm trying to play drums with 30 years of experience and engineer with like two years of experience and it slows you down all the time. Or I'm doing my videos and I go back and I'm like, how's that mic not turned on? Everything was going, and, but there's no snare or whatever, you know, you mm -hmm. kind of learn by doing those kind of things. So even making the drum videos is kind of a cool way of just teaching yourself how to get levels and how to make sure stuff's working and, that's how I started doing it and then started recording tracks for people. And then from there, especially in the pandemic, when I built this, I just started adding studio gear and I'm like, I'm going to up the interface, going to up the mics, I'm going to up the software and just started going along and piece at a time. And that's how, that's how a lot of guys build it and how I'm building it. But I just think I love that you could study engineering and drumming and music all at the same time, because if I could do it over and go back to 20 year old me, I'd be like, pay attention, go take some classes in the studio. I did none of that. <laughs> Well, experience and hardships are the best teacher. Yeah. When you mess up and think, oh man, the snare wasn't on. That was like the perfect take. I've done a lot of that, a lot of yeah. videos. I'm like, man, my enthusiasm was there. I didn't even have to use my script, but yeah. then I go to watch it back and my head was cut off. Right. <laughs> or something. <laughs> so, and then you gotta redo it. Mm -hmm. So we have got a beautiful DW drum kit. Can you tell me about the kit, like as far as dimensions, why you chose DW, heads, symbols, sticks, endorsements, yeah. all that great stuff? Absolutely. So I've been with DW officially 10 years and okay. yeah, signed with them a while ago now. And they were kind of always my dream. I'd played different drums growing up, but I always looked up to them as like, I knew they're super expensive and I knew in the store, they were always like, just, I love the look of them. And then for me, it was really Abe Jr. and Josh Fries. They were both Peisty and DW guys. So I was like, man, that's like, that's what I want to get to. So I've had several kits over the years. And right now I've got kind of three or four different kits that I always have a studio one, always have an in-town one, and one that can go on tour. And okay. I've got the little tiny mini pro, which is the tiny 18 inch kick. It's like coffee shop or worship gig or like house party or whatever. It's great for that rehearsals. This is my newest kit. And this one is actually weird cool because it was at Forks Drum Closet and it was a one-off that was made when they opened the new shop. Yeah. And so this is a, what's it called? It's called Contemporary Classic. So this is the only kit that I have that's not 
as standard as the others. And so this is mahogany poplar. So it's a little more mellow. The bearing edge is a little more rounded. Okay. So I've been kind of tweaking this to work for me because I'm so used to more punchy drums than most of the, the other kits I have. I have a jazz series, which is maple gum. Then I have a cherry mahogany. The DWs have a very distinct sound. They and do. They have punch and attack, and they're for what I do, and so much rock and country, like they're great for that. This is too, but this just is a little more mellow, a little warmer. So I put coated heads on top and bottom. So I have G1s on the bottom, G2 on top, which I don't normally do that, but I thought that'd be good because it's a little more mellow. 13, 16 toms. This is a 24. It's the very first 24 I've owned in my whole life. And with all the knee problems, I've had six knee surgeries, so I genuinely hate 24s. I was like, I'm never getting one. But I love this kit. It had been at Forks. They offered me a great deal on it. And I said, I'm going to try the 24 thing. This records so well, and it's been great. So I'm not playing like fast punk rock on this kit. I'd have trouble with the kick size, but this sounds great, at least to my ears. I love it. DW, all my kits are DW. I have a bunch of different snares, but what's really cool on this snare, this was a one-off with this kit. So it matches the kit, but because the new owner of Forks also owns Craviato drums, this is a Craviato snare, so it's a maple steam bent one ply shell but in the matching finish so kind of done as a one-off this whole kit and that's kind of why i wanted it even though i never buy gear at retail anymore i just buy it through my endorsements but this mm -hmm. was like just a cool offer so that's why i did that and then the heads i've been with evans for 17 years they've been so good to me as a company and steve lobmeyer is the dude he's come out to see me at shows from punk rock to country gigs to rock gigs. You see me play with staff. They've been so good to me and I love their products. And in Nashville, you get a lot of fight back and forth between Remo and Evans, whatever. Play what you like. I don't care if you don't play what I play, but I love what I play and it sounds great. So I always do EMAT on the kick. I use a bunch of different ones. Usually the heavyweight, which is their two ply is what I use on the road. This I'm using the UV1 coated because again, I was going a little more mellow, but even, I mean, even not being mic'd up like sounds great that sounds solid yeah that's what i'm using on these on tour lots of times i use ec2s which are clear with a little ring it's like a g2 it's kind of like a emperor from if you want remo but the little ring's a little bit of muffling so it's not a pinstripe people always think it's a pinstripe but it's it's still got more ring than that so that's a lot of times my road thing but i change it up i use all their snare heads i use three or four different tom heads i'm super big on two ply on tom so i like how they mm -hmm. feel I like a little more muffling. I like that if I hit hard, they're not going to, you know, they're going to last just fine. So to me, two ply is the way to go for just for how I play. And then Peisty, let's see, I've been with them probably 12 or 13 years, a long time. I had a deal with Meinl before that, and Peisty came along and offered me this great deal, and I couldn't turn it down at the time. And I had grown up playing Zildjian and Peisty, and those were kind of always what I listened to. I was thrilled to like to actually join their family because they're a pretty tough one to get into kind of like dw it's like mm -hmm. just not everybody gets to deal with them and so i play kind of all their high-end models different ones on the road i play their big beats which are their newer 2002s and i think of 2002s i think of like later bonham played that alex van halen's 2002 there's a lot of rock guys and they sound great they're a little bright but when they came out with the big beats they're a little more mellow and they're thinner so they're just slightly darker but still I mean, I could play rock, I could play country, and they work great. And then recording, I always use a little bit darker stuff, like this is a traditional light ride, so it pings. Um, it's got a really good wash if you lay into it. And they're not like Istanbul dark, but they're darker for sure. And they're pretty big too. Yeah, that's kind of my thing. That's just, I like bigger symbols. So my crashes are always 20 or 20 okay. or 21. I usually stick with a 22 ride. Sometimes I'll go to a 24, but I'm not a very big guy, so okay. that's a lot of symbol and can be loud. I generally land on 15 hats for everything, but okay. these two are modern essentials, which is the line. When Vinny Caliuta came from Zildjian to Peisty, they developed this whole line around him, and they it's kind of like they're all-purpose. You could use them anything, and they're going to sound great. Those track amazing. And then this is a Dark Energy Crash in a 20. That's Mr. Brown, my dog. <laughs> this Dark Energy Crash, they don't make... It's like you have to custom order it. So I found it, had forks used, and I bought it. They made it for like two years. That's my one unicorn symbol I never take on the road because I don't want to break it, but it tracks super well. So that's my main setup for the kit. I've been with Promark maybe eight or ten years. So I was with Vic Firth for nine years before that. They make great sticks, but 
Promark offered me an amazing deal, and Diodario bought Promark at some point. Mm-hmm. I've already been Diodario is Evans as part of that. And I said I'm not switching until they make a stick I like, and I finally started trying some and did so. What I've, size do you use? I use a couple different models. This is a five B long. Okay, that's um, what I like too. And what they the cool thing Promark started doing in that era, oh, probably eight or ten years ago, is start doing all Promark sticks are weighted towards the front. Mm-hmm. And Vic first are weighted towards the back. And so, <laughs> Promark started doing select balance where you could buy the stick in, say, a 5A or 5B where it was front weighted or rear weighted. Once they started doing rear weighted sticks, basically you it feels like a Vic first. So, if you're used to that world, that's how you would transition. Some guys just like the front weight, but you get more wrist problems from that, from my experience. So, this 5B long is great. And then I use the SD9 as well on the road, which is a little thicker. That's Teddy Campbell's signature stick. It's a rock model. It's like a slightly thicker 5B. Pretty close to that. So I use those both all the time. Okay. And then my newest change, I was an Onyx endorser for, I don't know, close to 10 years. And they were cool. I love their mics. They sound great. But in the last two years on the road, this company's newer, SE Electronics, we started using them on the road with staff. And this is thanks to Kyle Gerhardt. He's our sound guy, front of house guy. He's unbelievable. He's an Onyx guy, and he started using SE, and so we started trying both. We used them the whole setup live, and so all the last year we used them with staff, and they did a tour with Kurt Dimer, and this was a rock guy, a tour with All Fall, Phil X from Bon Jovi was in the band, this was like a great experience, and so we were all using them across the stage, and this was, I mean, just an awesome setup. And so these are actually overheads, these are their 440s, which are kind of like a 414. AKG 414 kind of clone, and so I had AKG 414s up here until a couple months ago, and then I got this whole setup from SC, and so I was using these as overheads. They sound killer. I'll probably go back to that next week. I'm just trying them on toms. I've never tried them on toms. And all their V-series mics are, you know, this is comparable to their 57. What's cool is, looks-wise, they put the red grill on everything. So if you see it in a picture and you see a red grill, you're like, you just know those are SC mics. Then on the floor is their normal tom mics. So they have such clean mounting. They're super easy to work with. The first time I saw them, Aaron Sturman was using their kick mic in a video. And their kick mic is small, but what's really cool about it on the back here, and you can't see it from there, but you can just flip this if you want classic or modern. And so it can go more punch or more boom with just flipping the switch. So and it's like a, I don't know, $250 mic. It's not expensive. So anyways, all that to say, I made the switch this year, and I just was like, well, I'm going to switch entirely to all I see because... I think now that I've tried them on the road, I know they sound great, and I know they're going to work for what I do. And this is probably the coolest thing, to make ribbon yeah, mics. ribbons. And that's crazy to think you. I'm using them as no, normal overheads, but these especially sound so clean. And these are the VR1s. They have VR1s and VR2s, and I think it's active and passive versus those two. These sound great as overheads. I'm probably going to try them as rooms. Just a lot of the companies, if you go sure, Sennheiser, they all make great mics. And mm-hmm. when I was with Audix, like, there's just not ribbon mics for most of those companies. So to have all these encompassed into one one company is great. So for me, this has been a great switch. But like anything, you learn, you grow, you try stuff. I'm going to keep my KG 414s. I'm sure I'll throw them in the mix again here and there. I'm with Warm Audio. I've been with them for a long time as well. So yeah, we've got a 47 Junior. Yep, that's out front. Just a couple other you know unique pieces I've added. There's no Yamaha Subkick anymore. So this mic is called Solomon a Low Frequency. Low Freak. I have yeah. one of those. I love it. Yeah, so it's a Subkick. You blend them in together. It really gets that punch. Yeah, and so it's nice because you get all that low end. And this is the most unique one, but this is called the Dirt Mic, and it's basically one of those... Um, I think bullet harmonica kind of mics. Yeah. This guy in Australia hot rods them out, so it's historic all the time. So it adds that low crunch in the mix, and you can't turn it off. So it's a one-trick pony, but it's really nice to just add like 10% in there, and it makes all your drums a little bit bigger. Makes them fuzzy, yeah. 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 I have yeah. a question on the rooms. What are those? Those are Cascade Fathead 2s, which are ribbon mics as well. Pretty inexpensive. They're pretty dark, I think, from my experience. I'm not super versed in ribbon mics. They sound totally different than these, though, which is interesting. Yes. But those are a really cool options. So we had those when I was a student at SAE. We yeah. Use those a lot. I like them. Yeah, they come out really great for rooms. I'm going to try these as rooms. And then the the junior, I kind of move back and forth. I'm still trying to dial that in the best spot. But this is what I'm working with mics wise right now. Do you want to check out the, uh, the rest of the setup back there? Yeah, for sure. So, one thing I forgot to ask when we were talking earlier is you're currently on tour with Dylan Carmichael. Yeah. 
How's that going? Man, it's been great. I started with him in January. He's got to be one of the best singers I've ever played for. And I know a lot of people say that here and there. I've played for a lot of good singers. I'm not putting down anybody that I've played for. But, and this guy's unbelievable. And such a talented kid. And he's 28. But he writes and he sings and he's just a great performer. And he's from a family of country stars. His uncles are both big country stars. The guys in the band are great. It's been great to have the work too. Because all January and February I've been out every weekend. And I've been home teaching. So... That's been fun to get back. I've kind of been able to bounce back and forth from country to rock and country to rock. Before this, I've played for Craig Campbell in the country world, the Swan Brothers, Josh Grayson, Teddy Robb, a handful of other dudes, Tucker Bethard. And so I love doing both. And people are like, do you enjoy country? Are you a country guy? I didn't grow up on country. When I was in high school and college, I've been like, I hate it. It sucks, whatever. And the more I started listening to it, and you get used to it, you're just like, man, these are great songs and great stories and great singers and great musicians and I started studying country drummers on records and what they were doing it's just like man it's another cool world so I try to play the country stuff as authentic as I can like last week this is one of the biggest compliments I could get we're playing one of the tin roofs and afterwards the sound guy doesn't know me from anywhere and he comes up and he was a guy working at the venue he doesn't know about my rock background he's like man I just really appreciate how well you played the room very few drummers come in and don't overplay the cymbals and play too loud he's like everybody thinks they're a rock star and comes in and bash and I didn't want to say, hey, I'm a rock drummer and I do this and this. I was just like, man, that means a lot because that is my goal to play country in this setting as authentic as I can and back the band and back the artist and be, be the supporting guy, but to do it and sound correct, authentic, musically to the best that I can. So that was a huge deal to me. And so, yeah, I have to say Dylan's got a ton of stuff coming up and on the horizon for him. And I'm excited just to see where he goes as an artist. That's exciting. Uh, which tin roof was that? I don't know. We've played like 20 of them. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> We've played all of them in the last two months. So. Okay. So yeah, they're not real big venues, but that, that speaks volumes yeah. because you played with a wide variety of artists, tours, arenas. Yeah. When you're in a smaller venue like that, you know how to play to that. Yeah, the dynamics are, are a huge deal. And that's something I work on all the time is like, I want to go into any gig and be like, you look at me and my tattoos and think I can't play quiet, but I'm going to play quiet enough that it's going to work <laughs> and it's going to sound good. So that's always a goal of mine because there's probably, that room was packed and it might have been maybe 300 people. Like it was pretty small. So it was a good night. So yeah, Dylan's been good. Have some Scott dates coming up this year as well. We'll see what comes with him. Probably some Kurt dates coming up with Kurt Dimer Band, which would be good. I'm doing Easter with Sonic Flood. So yeah, thankfully I've kind of built uh, all these artists that I work with here and there. And none of them play all the time, so you're gonna have things that conflict. But it's nice if they're if they're kind of spaced out. I'll try to try to juggle them all. One thing that we didn't talk about in the pre-production. This is kind of off the cuff here, but what is one piece of advice that you would give to somebody that might be watching this? Maybe yeah. a 12 year old kid, like the younger version of us, that's wanting to build a life like this. What advice would you give to them? If you're a kid and you're starting, I would say. Take lessons, learn to read music, and if you have a chance, study another instrument. I didn't. My mother taught piano. I didn't take lessons, and I've regretted it forever. So just like you know, you said you, you did sax, if you can do anything else, it's just going to make you better. So as a musician, as a kid, starting out, and I always encourage my students, like, listen to other music. Listen to stuff you don't like. There's great music all across the world. And then if you're getting more serious and you're like, hey, I'm 25 and I'm trying to decide what to do, my biggest advice is, You've got to live somewhere where music is, and this is hard to hear, but if you don't live in L.A., Nashville, New York, maybe Dallas or Austin, it's very hard to do this full time. It's hard enough anyways, even in the remote world. You can track drums from anywhere, but if you want to tour and you want to be a touring drummer, you've got to live in one of our cities. That's just the bottom line. That's why I made the move. People are like, it sucks. I don't know if I can do it. I'm scared. It is. It is for all of us. It was for you, I'm sure. It was for me. And you make the move and you make the jump and people are like, well, what if I'm good enough? Won't they hire me living in Wyoming? Probably not. Maybe one in a million, but you're better to move here if you want to do it because there's plenty of gigs and work here. And yes, it's overwhelming and it's oversaturated, but you got to live in Music City. That's my, <laughs> that's my big two cents on it. Beautiful. What about you? What do you tell people? What's your advice? Yeah, like you said, Evansville is nowhere near the size of Nashville. I mean, a hundred and... 30,000 maybe compared to well, like what 1.5 mil or something like that now music is there you just have to be there you have to be like you said where it's at I would say learn your craft be good at it be 
like we talked about, learning different styles. Be as versatile as you can, mm-hmm. and just be a good hang. Yep, because nobody the... wants to work with a jerk, we'll say that. As a sound guy, it's a pleasure to work with artists that you can gel together and not bump heads. There's always the classic joke, hey, I need more me in my monitor. And sometimes that is right, but you can only go so much. But yeah. just being a good person to gel with because people know Dango. They know Dango's name, Dango Empire. That's how you keep getting business. So that's what I would say is be a good hang. Man, and that's kind of the next step. If you move here and you're in Music City and you're like, am I good enough? Everybody here is good enough. So you can't be overwhelmed with, is this guy way better? This girl way better than me? They might be. It doesn't matter. Do what you do well, but getting on the road and working with people, like we always say, 23 hours of your day is spent with people on the road, one hour is playing music. So if they can get along with you, I'm not saying like I'm the greatest guy because I've had times where I've been negative and I've gotten fired for different things. So it happens. It does happen. All human. But you learn from that and you go, man, I got to be easier to work with. I can't be a pain about everything or a diva about this or this or whatever. The more easygoing you can be to get along with people, like, that's what people love, just like you're saying. Like that will keep you going. Because when you're stuck in an airport at 3 a.m. and you haven't slept, or you're stuck in a van for 12 hours or whatever, you're going to be in these settings where nobody's in a good mood. You just got to go, you know what? That's okay. I'm thankful to be here. I'm playing music today and could be worse. And that's that's a good way to keep just a level head about it. And the, the dudes that do that, they keep rising and going to bigger and bigger gigs and they're just always humble because they think back, man, look at all this journey I've come through. And that's what, that's what I try and do. So, not every gig's awesome, not every travel's awesome, not every session's awesome, but some of them are. And so you gotta be thankful because even the crappy ones can lead to something else. And even so, you're still playing music. You could be out, you know, digging ditches or whatever. Very true. Yeah. So remember that, kiddos. Be a good hang. <laughs> right. Yeah. We've talked about a lot of great stuff your drums, your setup, some of the artists that you worked with. Can you tell me about your studio and how you actually built this and the yeah. time frame? And- so I bought this house two years ago in January, right before the pandemic started. Okay. Huge blessing that it worked out. And I'd never owned a house. And here I was like, as a newly kind of single guy, I'd been divorced for a year and saved up and had a chance to buy this. And it just turned out to be great. And right when I walked in, I opened the door. And I was like, the garage has a high ceiling. This is it. Like I've always wanted a studio. Let's do it for real. So my buddy, Sammy Bones, who's kind of a wizard of all these things. He was our guitar tech on the road with Scott Staff. And then he toured last year with Kurt Dimer as well. So both those artists that I play with, we're real close friends. And he basically was like, I can do that. I can do the lighting. I can do the electrical. I can do the insulation. I can do the brickwork and the mortar. And I was like, how do you know this stuff? And he's just one of those guys. So this was just a basic, long, single-car garage with a high ceiling. And basically, totally removed the garage door first. You can kind of see the lighting we put up above, but there's a whole basically this much insulation all the way around and all the way on the ceiling. And then those huge eight foot panels he built to go there, laid all the flooring, did the heating and AC in here, did all the electrical. If you go outside the house, I decided to do a stone wall in the front and that's one that he had to do by hand and that took a long time. He worked hard on it by himself for four months to build this whole room. And you know, know all the paints and all the final touches. And one of my favorite things that you kind of can't see unless you're up close, but all these outlet switches, I think spray painted all those to be that copper gold color. And it's in all the okay, recessed matches. places in there. Yeah, so it was just cool he did all that. And so we did a ton of sound treatment in here. We tried different things. And the last piece was we put a plug that there's a door right here. And sound was getting out there. And I got one complaint from the neighbor. And I'm like, I just spent like, over 10 grand on this house is an issue right away. I've never had a complaint in a previous house, but if I was going to be tracking late at night, I wanted to do it. So Sam mm-hmm. and I worked on it and came up with this idea of we put a plug in, it could come in and out. So the doors doesn't have to go. And I kept one window in the back and it's triple pane there. So we added more glass and he sealed all the glass. So a little bit of sound gets out from all the spots and into the house. But generally speaking, like I can track at one in the morning and I'm not going to wake the neighbors. So Awesome. It's been great, and now I'm just coming on two years. I've just passed 100 sessions in here in the last couple of weeks. So. Congrats, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> For just kind of building it, not knowing if I'd get any work, the timing with the pandemic was great because I was able to keep teaching and start recording from here while awesome. everybody was stuck home. Right on, congrats. Yeah. yeah, like when I went outside to get my um, gear, I could hear 
but it just sounded like a little radio that was playing. Yeah. One thing that I love about that wall mm -hmm. is my family back in Indiana has a masonry company. Oh, yeah. So seeing the one outside, a wall outside, and like this being a musician, engineer, and drummer. Yeah. A lot of times you'll see that in a studio setting, in a live room, control room to like disperse sound. I think that's cool having it behind the kit. Yeah, I get some flack for it, but it looks great. And I'm like, well, if it looks great, some people are going to call me for that. So, <laughs> But it <laughs> sounds great, have, too. Yeah. It, and it just good. looks cool whenever you're doing your social media. Yeah. And you have the lights and you see that and you're doing different angles. Those lights are Amazon. I just shop for different places and I think this wall is from Wayfair. I kind of designed it to look how I wanted and didn't care what anybody thought, so... It's definitely very me. So lots of drums, <laughs> yeah. lots of drum cases, protection. Who's your go-to for drum protection? Okay, so Humes and Berg are the cases for sure. And Mike Berg has been making these forever. But the hard cases, the soft bags, man, I love his stuff. And I'm real OCD about my gear. You look at all these and you're like, what do you even have? But I've got a ton of great snares, but I just keep them all in these so that they're clean. So I've got a couple different kits. One's always usually on a trailer on the road somewhere. One's set up here. And then a few other extra options. Yeah, I'm less than fortunate to have too much stuff. I mean, they really are all tools and I use them. A principle for me is if I don't use a snare for a year, then I go, it's time to sell. If I haven't used it on a session or anything, so... That's kind of my own thing to keep track of all the gear I have. I do have a lot, and yeah, I'm glad you asked because I want to give a shout out to Mike Berg and yes. Hughes Berg cases for sure. Yes, thank you, Michael, for making all those. And big shout to Mark Ali of Ali Visuals that has done the Humes and Berg documentary. We should yeah. have him out here to do that for, sure. for you. I feel like I'm in a Guitar Center <laughs> Sweetwater store. Yeah. We've got all the Evans and Pisces heads over there and symbol stuff. All the stuff over here, sticks. Yeah, and I always keep practice pads for all my drum students. I always have a ton of Evans heads. I'm super fortunate to have. I've always got options, so if I need to run and check something out or change something or try something different on a snare, so it's a lot in one small space, but it's my studio, so but hey, I do it. this is Dango's Beat Lab, yeah. so this is what <laughs> makes it unique. Right. I was an early warm audio guy, shot one of their first drum videos. They've been good to me and I've got eight of their kind of API clones, which is their 412. And so I'm running eight real preamps, external preamps, which lots of times guys don't do that at all. They just go straight to an interface. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that does make a difference. And then I was using a Focusrite for a long time. It was fine, it did fine. It's a great place to start. And finally I was just like, if I'm gonna start making money, I'll upgrade. Yep. So everybody said go to an Apollo. So I went to Apollo X8P which has the pre's built in as well. Yeah, um, so you've got the the X8 piece, so you've got like the six chips or something like six yeah. or eight. Yeah, ooh, nice. They're like 3,500 bucks anywhere you get them. Sweetwater, doesn't matter. Yep. You get a deal, they're still not gonna be cheap. And I bought that, and I bought a second one that was a four channel, so I was running 12 channels. And then in the last year, I basically bought a whole second one. So now I've got 16, I sold the four. So I've, I mean, I've got seven grand in the two Apollos alone, which is, a ton, but you can write it off. It's tax deductible. <laughs> I'm doing this for a living and I just think keep building it. You know, I will say Lester Stell has been probably the biggest encouragement that Lester. him and Elton Charles have helped me both drummers, great engineers, great drummers, but Lester's come over so many times just been like, if you're doing this professionally, do it professionally. Don't get a rinky dink set up in $10,000 of drums and think you're going to make it sound great. And he was just so good about encouraging that. He's like, I know you can't afford it all today, but keep building it because Eventually, you're going to be glad you have three different snare mic options. He's like, why own 30 snares if you're only going to own mics that cost 500 bucks for everything you own? It's just not worth it. And he was on the home tracking thing. I mean, he built a studio in like 05 or 06, like before guys were doing it in town. So he's been so encouraging with that. So I was like, you know what? I'm doing the two Apollos. So I've got 16 channels of those. I do use the plugins on those, and I will say... They're game changers. Anybody who buys one of these just notices the difference right away. And you gotta buy the plugins, they're all expensive. You just have to figure out what works for you. But I yeah. use the Neve ones on the drums, the 1073, there's a bunch of Neves, but the standard 1073, I use the API. Those two, I can mix and match those two and get anything I wanna get. It's nice to have the other options. I also bought the SSL one. Sometimes I'll switch between those three. Basically, I made templates of Neve drums, API drums, and SSL drums. And I'm still running my warm audio pre's through it, so maybe that's contradictory and shouldn't be done. I've talked to guys, they're like, you might as well. If it sounds good to you, who cares? For me, the sound is real, like I want it authentic. If I hype it with plugins on the end, like I use the Chris Lord Algae plugins, if I'm sending a mix to somebody, 
But if I'm, you know, bounce the drums raw, that's not on there. If I want it to sound like it's gonna hit like it's a Foo Fighters record or something, then you throw on the plugins here. But if you're tracking for somebody and they just want raw drum, then I don't send it with any of that. I just send send it raw. But my raw is still gonna have the Apollo stuff on there. If I put a Neve 1073 on every drum, overhead, and whatever. I'm printing it that way, and nobody's going to say, this sounds too processed, because it doesn't. They sound so good and so real, and you can track them live in real time, and it doesn't mess up. One secret that I learned from somebody that I've tried, it's not going to work in every setting, but I've only got called on it once, is the Ocean Wave plug-in, putting it on the room mics. And I print it on my room mics, and it just sounds a little bit bigger and a little bit darker. I don't even know how to describe it. It just has an epic sound, but it still sounds like a room. It's not like you put it on your room, and you sound like you're in a cavern. If you do that, anybody's gonna listen and go, this doesn't work. But it tweaks to the size of your room, it just sounds so good. I don't always do that, but I often will do that. And that's the only kind of fake sound I'm using in my actual setup here. This is something I tracked last week. I know we're hearing the audio through my monitors. They're not even my monitors. Lester let me borrow those like five years ago and they're still here, so. That happens a lot. He's that good of a guy and that does happen. People let you borrow stuff. What kind of monitors are those? Their event, something or other, and I don't know. And I know they're not cheap, but it's just, I'll give them back to him one day. But shout out to Lester, thank you for all your help. There's probably 20 guys in town who could say that to him. Thank you for something. Sure. So here's my drums with all my plugins on it and everything, kind of my mix. this distorted mic that's under the ride. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So you just mix a little of that in and it just fattens everything. Yeah, so that's just kind of a little clip. That would be my drums without the rest of the music in there. You know, people are going to mix it however they want and they're mm -hmm. going to put their own samples and whatever on there. I'm fine with that. That's modern music, but uh, my goal is give them the best sound that's real up front that doesn't have a bunch of fake stuff on it to the best I can. I'm learning you would know way more about engineering than me for any of this stuff. But that sounds great. That sounds well, amazing. I appreciate it. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else in this setup. I mean, as far as my gear, I ask guys all the time about lessons. How do you do lessons? I literally just run them on an iPad and I used to try to run all the mics, you know, into Logic and then into FaceTime or into Skype and it's too much. The buffering can't handle it. It's too much mm -hmm. information. So it stops. And I used to have an external camera I'd try and it would it wouldn't work so I know things have improved and maybe with zoom I could do it but I literally do my lessons I plug in headphones to the iPad and I just go and I play like three-fourths volume so symbols aren't distorting all the time I know there's better ways so guys if you have a better way let me know how I could run it live but I also don't want to come in for every lesson and spend 10 minutes setting up the audio to get everything mic do I have one vocal mic and just an overhead I don't know there's lots of ways to do it but I've just scaled down to be easy for lessons and if I'm recording, I, that's when I bring out all this stuff. That's the setup for here. Okay, awesome. One thing I was gonna say is you've got amazing equipment. So in anything that you do, whether you're playing drums or if you're a surgeon, you can't use a butter knife to operate on your patient. So you've definitely got the tools, the trade, and it sounds amazing. Well, thank you. That's how I explain gear to people. Like, why do you have all these snare drums? I'm like, well, you don't need them, but it's different tools of the trade. If you're not gonna have the same wrench to do everything, Different snares sound different, different kits sound different, same with cymbals. You can do it all with one, but if you're doing it for a living and you have the option and you can afford it, or you have help from the companies like I've been fortunate to do, then why not have all the options? Because you can do different things and I can take a different setup for country, a different one for rock, and a different one for worship. And I've got the options here, so. For sure. One question I had was, what's the process as far as if somebody contacts you? I guess they can do that, like you said, through IG or maybe your yeah. website. What's the turnaround time for that as far as if you get something, how long does it take you to track? And I know you said you yeah. sent them the raw file so they can do whatever they want. So most of the time people hit me up on Facebook or Instagram or it's people I know. And that's 98% of my work. If somebody messages me on Facebook or Instagram and I haven't met them, but they're like, hey, I follow you. I want you to play drums on this song. Will you do it? So I just say, you know, here's what I charge. Here's what I want to do. How many songs do you want? How quick do you need it? I always ask. Okay. They're like, hey, I need this tomorrow and I can pay you this much. Can you do it? If I can do it, I always will. I'd rather be working than not working. Sometimes if it's a rush situation, they're going to throw me extra money. Sometimes they don't. 
Sometimes they're like, I've got three days. Can you get it to me by Thursday? And I say, sure. So I try to knock it out as soon as I can. If I'm home, that's when I do it. Weekends, I'm never tracking because I'm always on the road or usually on the road. I try to bang it out. I teach lessons Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Wednesday. So Monday, I'm usually tracking. Tuesday, I could be tracking. If you want me to play on something, great. I would love to. Hit me up on any of those platforms. If you message me, you can email me, dango at dangoempire.com or direct message me on Instagram, Facebook. I will always get back to people. And I love when it's referral because that's how you build the clients and that's how people call you back. And there's a couple of people in Australia who've called me. I've got some guys in California and Washington, Seattle area that call me. Got some guys up in the Northeast and a few guys in Texas. You know, you just hope you keep these clients. Sometimes they call you again, sometimes not. But my goal is to do a great job. I bounce down all the files. Like right now, I'm doing 13 different mics on the kit. So for your song, I'm not going to send you 10 takes of it. I'm going to send you a good finished take that's all clean. You know, if I had to edit something, I want to make sure the punches are clean. If there's no edits, I usually play it enough that I just get a take all the way through. That's how I like to do it. And I'll send you 13 different tracks of all those mics, bounce them down, take my plugins off, and then that's how I send them over. You know, we transfer Dropbox or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get that, and then you can mix them however you want. I've kind of debated with guys, do you quantize, do you do all that stuff before you send it? Because almost everybody's going to do that if they want to do it. Most people are like, don't mess with your drums, you know, leave them how they are real. I want to keep as much real in there. Most of the time I'm doing that and it kind of takes the extra editing out of there for me. Here's another question. When clients send you sessions or songs, yeah. do you have them send you the entire session or just like an MP3 and then you just track to that? Man, that's across the board because you'll get the acoustic demo that's out of time, barely to a click that you're trying to play to, and you'll get like this thing that I just did. It's all produced, but there's probably 20 other tracks of instruments on there. Fully produced sounds like an entirely mixed thing without drums. So you gotcha. kind of get the spectrum in between. A lot of guys nowadays, cause, and girls, are better about it and know what they're doing. So a lot of people are tracking stuff to a click at home, and they're gonna be like, here's the rough demo, I'm gonna retrack these guitars, but everything's in time, it sounds great, it's easy to play to. And it's great even if they program something, go, here's the drum part, kind of, but make it better. I always say, tell me what you want. Tell me everything you want in there. I'm going to get as close as I can. Sometimes if they just know me, they say, play whatever you want. Nine times out of ten, I don't want to waste the time going back and doing it 87 times. So I'd just rather you go, you know what, I really just want a kick, snare, hat on the verse. Or I just really wanted toms, because if you don't tell me and I try the other thing and there's no conversation about it. But a lot of guys are producers or are coming up. I want to make this sound like this, or I want a cold play thing, or I want it to sound a little bit like whoever. And if you tell me that, that helps, because then I, I know the band, or if I don't, I pull it up in reference, or a song, I can try to get those drum tones to the best of my ability. So I like when I get the instruction, that really helps. Yeah, I'd say 70% of the stuff I track to sounds pretty good before I play on it, and 30% is a little rougher. And like yesterday, I had a singer, songwriter in here who's a friend, and she just had an acoustic version, but it was solid, it was too quick. We were playing like a rock rock thing, so she wanted it pretty heavy and kind of busy, and I'm just playing to an acoustic guitar and vocals. But she was here as well and on headphones, so we could talk through, and it was nice. I do it that way sometimes too. I've had a couple guys this year come over, you know, be in the room while I'm tracking. That saves so much time, because they can tell you they like it, they don't like it. And that's the hardest part for drummers doing it remotely, is you send people these tracks and then they want revisions. And I'll do those, but I'll usually say, if you don't like anything, I'll fix it once. Don't ask me to fix it 10 times if it's just stylistic, like I didn't mess something up. And there's some clients that I've worked with where they want the changes 10 times. And I'll just be like, look, you're gonna have to pay me quite a bit more. Right. Because every time I do this, I'm leaving the kit set up for you to make sure you're happy with how it turned out. Because I might have moved on to a different snare and different symbols for another track, but I've kind of got to go back to exactly what I had in mm -hmm. that session to keep it close. So that's just part of the remote thing. It's a little bit of a hassle, but it still works out. You know, for the most part. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, guys, ladies and gents, this has been Dango's Beat Lab. Thank you so much, brother, yes. for having me out. It's good to finally meet good you. Good to finally meet. This is the first yeah. time we've met. It's interesting how it all works. Facebook will recommend that you may know somebody. It's been, what, eight months in yeah, the process? Something. Something like Less that. than a year, though. I'm a big fan of believing in the Lord's timing, so we're here. Yeah. We talked shop it's been great so thank you for opening your home your studio sharing it with me the world yeah dw knows who i am now because of a social media post heck yeah man i'm honored thank you for coming i'm thrilled to share any knowledge i could have with anybody but especially to future drummers or fellow drummers or just musicians doing this but man thanks for taking the time and 
bringing your whole setup and all the production. And I'm excited. I appreciate you doing it. For sure. It's a uh, something I love to do is share my passion with others and put them in the spotlight. This whole thing is not about me. I'm trying to do it for a bigger purpose. But if somebody does want to contact you for tracks, how can they get a hold of you? Facebook, Instagram, or my email, dango at dangoempire.com. Those are all super easy. We all carry phones now, so I'll respond to any of them. Perfect. Well, guys, you know what to do. Hit them up there on those various platforms. And this has been a Legacy Studios and Dango Empire production. Thanks. We'll see you in the next one. Yo, my name is Paul the Fifth.